Our journey begins on the border of western Montana in the Bitterroot Mountain Range, an instant introduction to the rugged landscape that lies ahead. We enter the Kootenai National Forest for our first look at some of the country's most pristine bodies of water, as well as the engineering masterpiece that is the Libby Dam. From the northernmost point of our journey in the Whitefish Mountains, we begin tracking the Flathead River as it courses south. Its path takes us to the gateway of Glacier National Park in Kalispell, Montana. Our journey concludes with an exploration of the stunning scenery around Flathead Lake, as well as the oldest settlement along its banks, the town of Polson. The vast Bitterroot mountain range, named after the state flower of Montana, is a sub-range of the Rockies and spans nearly 62,000 square kilometres. That's almost the size of the entire state of Florida. At the Bitterroot northwest section are the Coeur d'Alene Mountains, and it's here we catch a glimpse of Cherry Peak in the distance. Rugged and glacier swept, the range has earned the nickname the Montana Alps. Coursing through the range is the Clark Fork River. Renowned for its natural beauty, it's also been a major source of electricity since the construction of the Noxon Dam. When the plan was announced in the 1950s, the local mayor heralded the decision as the biggest thing that ever happened in the county. Completed in 1959, the hydroelectric plant has a current operating capacity of 466 megawatts of power. These are the remote peaks of the Cabinet Mountains. Here, snow falls all year round. This wet climate provides the mountains with vegetation uncharacteristic of western Montana. Many of its plant species are actually natives of the Pacific coast. Much of the Cabinet Mountain Range is part of the Kootenai National Forest, with laws that protect its many species, giving the region a reputation as one of the wildest in the US. Nestled among the high peaks is a true gem of western Montana, Bull Lake. With its pristine water and breathtaking scenery, it has become a popular site for summer homes and recreational activity. Most of the land is privately owned, including Angel Island. But the Kootenai Forest Service has been integral in preserving the lake's natural beauty. This area offers a variety of landscape, from the high rocky peaks to the groves of huge cedars and alpine meadows. Hidden within the 38,000 hectares are over 80 small blue lakes that feed streams which tumble into the moose country below. Beyond the eastern slopes of the Cabinet Mountain Range lies the Libby District. The population of the area soared after the discovery of gold deposits in the 1860s. One of the many mining sites was Big Cherry Creek, which runs 14 miles to the confluence of the Kootenai River. And as we prepare for a landing at the city's small airport, we pass Libby Creek, which was once another lucrative source of gold. Flying around this vast landscape means filling up with fuel at every opportunity, since airfields are remote.
With our tank full, we climb back into the skies to grab a bird's eye view of Libby. Lying in the heart of the Kootenai Valley, the city, which is barely five square kilometres, has been supported by the logging and mining industries. Although tourists are increasingly visiting in order to enjoy the mountains and river. The Kootenai courses through sparsely populated regions of the Pacific Northwest, with a dramatic two kilometre drop in elevation from its origin in British Columbia. It's one of the few North American rivers that starts in one country, crosses into another, and returns to the first. The river forms many rapids, and this stretch is popular for whitewater rafting. Approaching an area known as the Big Bend, the Kootenai surges around the south base of the Purcell Mountains, just below the Libby Dam. Spanning almost a kilometre and designed to withstand an earthquake registering 6.5 on the Richter scale, it's one of the sturdiest such structures ever built. Completed in 1972, the barrier is made up of 47 massive sections, designed as independent units. If one collapsed, the other 46 would remain standing. The dam forms a 140 kilometre long reservoir known as Lake Kukunusa, which stretches deep into neighbouring Canada. It was a joint project between the two countries with the aim of combating the costly flooding that occurred in spring and summer, as well as providing electricity. At full capacity, the Libby Dam passes 4,500 cubic metres of water per second. Its five turbines generate 600 megawatts of power, allowing it to service eight states. Although the engineering of the lake had a very practical purpose, the outcome was the creation of this majestic water scene, set against the backdrop of the Kootenai National Forest. It's home to a variety of sporting fish and offers year-round angling. Outdoor enthusiasts are also able to enjoy several beaches, hiking trails and camping on the waterfront. One popular site to set up camp is in the centre of the lake, Yarnell Island. Although the lake's name, Kukanooza, sounds very tribal, it was actually the result of a competition during its construction the winning entry was the combination of Kootenai, Canada and the USA, Ku Can Uza. A lesser known range in northwest Montana, the Salish Mountains, are filled mostly with tree covered summits, but we're lucky to find one of its open grassy valleys. The curvy Stillwater River snakes through Flathead National Forest. The Salish Mountains feature an extensive network of logging roads to support the timber industry, as well as many trails that climb from the valley floor to the peaks that range from 1,000 to 2,000 metres high. In the 1960s, the rapid pace of industrialisation across the nation became a major conservation issue. The US government's response was to establish the National Wilderness Preservation System of 1964 to designate regions as wildlife management areas. Both the upper and lower Stillwater lakes fall under this protection, guarding vital habitats for a variety of animals, from bald eagles to mountain lions. The protected area lies within Stillwater State Forest, Montana's oldest woodland. Covering over 38,000 hectares, it's also the state's largest. It's a favourite with hikers all year round, who enjoy climbs up to Antis Knob for spectacular views of places such as Swift Creek River. 
Crossing the valley, we come to the northernmost point on our journey, at the Whitefish Range. Since the peaks aren't particularly high here, they provide the right environment for red cedars and Douglas firs to grow in abundance. The same can't be said for their neighbours, the massive snow-capped mountains of Glacier National Park, which we see in the distance. Having reached the midpoint of our journey, we begin heading south along the Flathead River, which will guide us throughout the remainder of our expedition. This valley, known as Bad Rock Canyon, acts as a border between Glacier National Park and the Apgar Mountains. The river is commonly called the North Fork, which refers to the main stem of the Flathead that is joined by two other large tributaries. Deemed the wildest river in the continental United States by the New York Times, the Flathead has been designated as a national wild and scenic river. Unlike other major river valleys in Montana, Flathead has never been dammed for hydroelectric power or mined for natural resources, despite several recent efforts to drill for coal. Dipping into Glacier National Park, we follow a small tributary of the Flathead River, Camas Creek. Cutting through a series of rolling hills, it's joined by a road which offers park visitors a rustic and scenic entry point. Surrounded by picturesque meadows of tall grasses and Douglas firs, Camas Creek is a popular trail for horseback riding. We cross back over the mountain range at its southern tip and discover the charming lakeside city of Whitefish. A major recreation center of western Montana, the city has become both a retirement community and tourist draw to one of the state's most popular ski resorts with an economy supported by the logging industry as well. Despite a modest population of around 6,000, Whitefish, as of 2010, was Montana's 14th biggest city. It first thrived when the Great Northern Railway laid down tracks through the city in 1904. 20 years later, the company built this Tudor Revival-style depot. Thanks to preservation by the Stumpton Historical Society, the depot is on the National Register of Historic Places. Today, the station is the busiest hub for Amtrak's Empire Builder, a passenger train route from Chicago to the Pacific Northwest. Whether traveling to Whitefish by train, plane or car, visitors and residents most likely find themselves spending time by the water. Fed by several tributaries that flow through the Flathead watershed, this 11 kilometer long glacial lake is surrounded by mountain landscape. Dotted around its banks are several state parks, lakeside resorts, as well as pristine and sandy public beaches. While the city's biggest tourist draw may be the big mountain ski resort, the lodge here presents a leisurely, graceful stay with the amenities of a full-service resort. Tucked between Glacier National Park and the Kootenai National Forest, Whitefish Lake is one of Montana's true gems. We descend for our second landing on this journey at Glacier Park International Airport in the city of Kalispell. Although it does service commercial airlines, it's a popular landing spot for private jets and other aircraft due to its proximity to the park and the nearby resort towns. Back in the air, 
we return to the Flathead floodplain, jumping several kilometres downstream from its more turbulent beginnings. Here it spreads out over this flatter, glacially shaped valley on its way past our next stop, Kalispell. It's the largest city on our journey, as well as the largest city in northwest Montana. Known as the Gateway to Glacier National Park, Kalispell is a short distance from several resorts and parks. Its location led to the city's growth as the commercial, government and medical hub of Flathead Valley, symbolised by this historic courthouse erected in 1902. At an altitude of 900 metres, the city was named after its high elevation. Kalispell is a Salish Indian word meaning flat land above the lake. One of Kalispell's most endearing treasures is the Victorian home of the city founder, Charles Conrad. Built in 1895, the home's exterior is accented with arches, long gables and massive stone chimneys. Today the home is operated by the city of Kalispell as a museum and event centre, showcasing almost all of the original family furnishings throughout its 26 rooms over three floors. Conrad's grand residence rests on three landscaped acres, representing the vision he had for the entire city of Kalispell when he set foot here in 1891. We join the Flathead River once more as it flows past Kalispell. Here we see a considerable area of low-lying plains have been flooded. The level of flooding varies annually depending on the quantity of snow in the winter and the subsequent rainfall in the spring. The river flow is finally slowed as it drains into Flathead Lake. Several rivers and streams flow into this body of water, including Swan River in the northeast corner, where we find the quaint town of Big Fork. No longer a well-kept secret, publications have deemed this place one of the 50 great towns of the West and one of the 100 best small art towns. From its early days of a farming and timber economy, Big Fork now thrives as a community known for art, fine food and theatre, as well as growing its famous flathead cherries. Both the waterfront of Swan River and the 180 mile shoreline of Flathead Lake became prime real estate for luxury living. Big Fork is just one of several areas lined with ornate cabins built into the embankment of the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi River. As we head south, we saw close to the lake's choppy waters en route to the nearby cove of Woods Bay, which is set on the northern tip of Flathead National Forest. We linger for a while longer, taking in the beautiful sunset and shimmering reflections. The famous American author John Steinbeck once stated, I am in love with Montana. For other states, I have admiration, respect, recognition, even some affection. But with Montana, it is love. Steinbeck may well have been sailing upon the waters of Flathead Lake when he experienced these heartfelt emotions. We complete our tour here exploring several of the primitive islands in the southwest corner known as Big Arm Bay. Our first stop is Wild Horse Island State Park. Here, the Salish Indians would pasture their steeds to keep warring tribes from stealing them. A handful of wild horses still roam along the rugged prairie grasslands and gallop 
into the old growth Ponderosa pine forest. Despite the name of the island, a hundred other species of wildlife, such as bighorn sheep, mule deer and bald eagles, are native to the park. Rare and endangered plant species have also been found in the Palouse Prairie, the last remnant of Montana's native grassland. Owing to the strong winds here, sailboats are a very common sight. Though the island is clearly a favourite among hikers, boaters and swimmers, camping and biking is prohibited. But private homes have been present here since the turn of the 20th century. The 900 hectare island is mostly owned by the state and has been operated as a park since 1978. About a dozen smaller islands exist on the lake, most of which are inhabited by wildlife. Some real estate here can be quite expensive, with one home reportedly listing for 78 million American dollars. Admittedly, that's with the entire eight-acre island thrown into the deal. Located on the lake's southern shore, by Flathead River, is Polson. Before roads had been properly established in the area, the city was a transportation hub for steam and sailboats. Today, Polson is a popular summer resort destination and is at the heart of some of Montana's most fertile farming areas. Famous again for cherry orchards. Now, at the last leg of our journey, the lake empties into the lower portion of the Flathead River, which continues to drain downstream. It sneaks around the steep hillsides of the Flathead Indian Reservation for another 116 kilometres, eventually joining with the Clark Fork River. Whereas the upper section north of the lake has never been dammed, this lower section had a very different fate. 16 metres taller than Niagara Falls, this is the Kerr Dam. The concrete gravity arch structure was completed in 1938 and adds three metres to the depth of Flathead Lake. It's the largest electrical generating power plant in Montana. A walkway along the rim allows for dizzying views of the falls, as well as the river running into the canyon. Located within reservation boundaries, Kerr Dam is jointly operated by a private power company and the Flathead Tribe. And our last stop is in the company of a few daring travellers. While Flathead Lake might be an excellent spot for speed and sailboats, downstream provides excellent whitewater rafting adventures. The lower Flathead River is known for having the biggest, most consistent white water in the state. Rafters can choose from floating peacefully in calm waters to navigating the challenging 16 kilometers of class four white water known as Wild Buffalo Rapids. As we bid farewell to our friends on the river, we also end our journey through northwest Montana. Here the state motto is Oro y Plata, Spanish for gold and silver, a nod to a history of yielding fortunes in precious metals. However, the stunning panoramas, from the mountains to the valleys to the white water rapids, are perhaps even more valuable and a perfect place to end our journey.